Thank you. Thank you, Lifeline family. Man, it's so good to be with you guys tonight. What a wonderful time in worship, amen? Yeah. Time in communion. Just an incredible uh, opportunity to gather and just be refreshed in the Lord's presence tonight, amen? It's really good for, for us to be with you. Uh, my wife, Cynthia, and I. Cynthia, would you stand and say hi to everybody? We will be celebrating 37 years of marriage this year. It's a long time. <laughs> Whew, that's a long time. Uh, but it's good for us to be with you guys tonight. I hope that everybody had a great week. Um, yeah, we were looking forward to it on the drive over here. We, we don't have a, a midweek service uh, at our church, but we, uh, the bridge in, in San Carlos on the peninsula. And so we really, um, we miss the, the Wednesday night gathering. It's such a, a great opportunity to, in the middle of the week, just receive from the Lord and be able to fellowship with one another. Um, yeah, awesome. A little bit about me, guys, just for those of you that don't know me. Uh, I don't normally sound like Elmer Fudd. I have a little bit of a cold tonight, so that's just a disclaimer up front. Um, as I said, Cynthia and I have been married almost 37 years. We met in church. Uh, we met in, in my father's church uh, in Oakland, California. My dad was pastoring a four-square church there. And uh, Cynthia walked into the back of my dad's church. She was 13 years old. I was 15. And as every good uh, pastor's son, I was playing drums on the worship team and saw her come in. And honestly, before God and all the elders, it was love at first sight. And uh, she'll tell you this because after church, we, we went out into the courtyard and we were talking and getting to know each other. And uh, her mom came and said, honey, it's time for us to go. And so she got up to turn and leave. And, and uh, her name is Cynthia, but her family called her Cindy. So that was the, the first name that I knew her by. And she got up to walk away. And I don't know what came over me. Again, it was just love. It'll make you do crazy stuff. And she got up to walk away, and in front of God and the church and everybody, I said, Cindy, I'm going to marry you someday. <laughs> I'd only known her like an hour. That was the first day that we had met. But you know what? 37 years later, come on, church. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> we are blessed with five uh, grown children, and uh, three of them are married, and... Um, we're blessed with five grandchildren, four sweet little baby girls, and one handsome boy <laughs> holding it down for the family name, just hanging on to it, you know. Um, when we're all together, there's 15 of us. So, yep, we're a lot. We're a lot. And uh, Cynthia and I have been pastoring uh, in Foursquare for 30 years, and we've been in our current assignment almost 24 years on the peninsula, and... Uh, as Pastor Elliot shared, we are privileged to be part of this Foursquare family, um, this global movement that's all over the world, 150 plus countries, nearly 100,000 people around the world uh, worship under this scripture, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm a third generation Foursquare pastor. This is all I know. I love this family. And uh, three of our kids are, are licensed Foursquare pastors as well. Um, I have the privilege of, of serving 54 Foursquare churches throughout Northern California. And that's a new role in our denomination. It's called a regional pastor. And it really, it's just an opportunity for me just to have more friends, really. I, I love the pastors and leaders that I serve. And your pastors, Pastor Elliot and Pastor Tiffany, are absolute rock stars. I know you already know that, but I just want to say that in front of them. I love you guys, and it's been such a privilege for Cynthia and I to get to know you even better over the last couple of years. Thank you for your yes. They are area pastors. I don't know if they tell you this, but they are area pastors and serve a grip of churches here in this area and do it so well. In fact, I'm going to brag on you just for a minute, uh, Pastor Elliot and Pastor Tiffany. I was on the phone last week with one of the pastors here in your area. And uh, this pastor has been pastoring in Foursquare for a long, long time. And he is our elder. He is someone that we have looked up to for a long time as well. 
And I was on the phone with him talking about something unrelated that was going on in his church. And before we got off the phone, he said, hey, I just want you to know that uh, Ellie and Tiffany are doing a great job. And coming from him, this is a man that has been an area pastor, divisional superintendent, districts, I mean, all, all the things you can be. He said, they're doing a great job. He said, I get texts from them encouraging me and encouraging our church. And, and so I just wanted you guys to know that, that you're making a huge difference, obviously in this community, but in Foursquare churches around this area. And I am so proud to serve with you and to count you as friends. And thank you for inviting me to come and preach at your church. That's super fun too. Yeah. Thank you, babe. Cynthia is also a rock star. Um, not, only she, not only is she the executive pastor of our church in San Carlos, but she is also what we call a women's mobilizer uh, in our district. And that's four states that she serves uh, to be able to help women um, come into an understanding of their calling and purpose if they want to be licensed as a pastor, if they want to serve in any capacity of ministry, she really is a champion for that. And uh, I'm so proud of her and all the work that she's doing. Um, but it's just, it's just great to be together. You guys ready to get into the Word tonight? If you're ready, say ready. ready. All right, if you brought your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 15 or your phones. Yeah, that's all right. My message tonight is titled, Created to Flourish. Created to Flourish. And I believe that this is, uh, this is a word that the Lord has for us to lean into together tonight. The word flourish brings to mind a lot of wonderful things. I think to flourish is to increase, right? When we think of something flourishing, we think maybe even of agriculture, something that is growing or blossoming. To flourish means to be fruitful. I think to flourish means to be healthy. And I believe that God's will for every one of our lives, in literally every area of our life, is that we would flourish. Or as John writes here in John chapter 15, that we would bear much fruit. Psalm 92, I'm just going to read it for you. You don't have to turn there because I know I invited you to look with me at, at John 15. But Psalm 92 verse 12 says this, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age and they will stay fresh and green. That is a promise for who? For the righteous, which we are because of Jesus Christ, which we are because of the sacraments that we receive tonight and what they represent, the complete finished work of the cross and the power of the resurrection, that we are literally clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So this is a promise for you to flourish, to bear much fruit and as we study the scriptures, I really see that flourishing has been in the heart of God for his people from the very beginning, literally from the garden. God created everything, the heavens and the earth, and all that entails in that so that his people could flourish in it. His design for us would be that we would live the abundant life that Jesus came and redeemed for us that we lost because of sin. But from the beginning, what God created in the garden was really just a, a mirror of what God intended for our lives. And of course, I'm speaking of Adam and Eve as a, the mother and father, so to speak, of humanity, that that was God's plan. And so if, if, if you're in a season maybe where you feel a little dry, where you, you, you wonder if, if things are going to work out. Maybe things aren't going the way that you want them to. I want you to know that the promise of God for your life and mine is that we would flourish. That we would stay, the Bible says, fresh and green. I'm about that, right? That, we, that our lives would be so attractive because of the spirit of God within us, that people around us, even in the winter season, will be going, why do you look so good? 
What, what's going on with you? You look refreshed. Did you, did you have a great weekend? Did you party? It's like, yeah, in the house of God, yeah. right? Yeah, in the spirit of God. Yeah, I gathered with my family in Christ. Yeah, I, I've been reading this, this Bible study. You're telling your friends at work. I've been walking through this book of the Bible. I came out to church last night, and there was this dude with cool glasses came and preached at our church. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, that we would flourish. That's the promise, and it's the invitation for our good and for God's glory. Amen? Amen. 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 So what does that look like? What does it look like for us to flourish as the people of God? I want to give you a few things to consider. One, and first and foremost, is that it, it represents incredible closeness and fellowship with God. And again, we see that original design in the garden, don't we? Where God loved Adam and Eve and and would walk in in the cool of the afternoon with them in the garden where things flourish, right? Incredible closeness and fellowship. And again, that's an invitation, friend. God loves you. He's so excited about the work that he's doing in you. You may not feel this way about yourself all the time, but God is so excited about who you're becoming. He wants to be close to you. He wants to be at the center of every every area of your life. He he, he wants to begin every day with you and end every day with you. He he misses you when you don't seek him. Incredible closeness and fellowship, I think, is representative of a life that's flourishing. I believe as well that we would have healthy, loving relationships, right? Shouldn't that be the characterization of the body of Christ? I love Pastor Tiffany's uh, emphasis on the fact that we're a family. And that within our families, that that we would be breaking generational curses, that that we would be loving each other well and supporting each other well, that we would be growing in relationship and and learning to trust again. Anybody else had trust broken in your life, right? Um, We would learn how to forgive again and and, and really love again in, in a deep and a profound way. I believe that to flourish as the body of Christ is also that we would take good care of the temples that the Lord has given us. That we would have healthy bodies and minds and emotions. Does that make sense? That's part of the flourishing of what it means to be in the family of God. That we would be healthy, spirit, soul, mind, and body. I think in order to flourish, we would also be good stewards. We'd be good stewards of the things that God has given us, right? When I I think about how many people are overwhelmed with the the burden of debt and, 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 and just striving to try to make ends meet instead of really pulling back from the mechanism of our culture and trusting God with their first and best and then stewarding well the rest that he's given us to steward, There's another level of flourishing even in our finances if we'll trust God with everything because it's all his. It's all his anyways, amen? I believe that to flourish means that we would be a powerful witness to the world of his love and grace, right? Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they will see the good works, the things that God is doing, the transformation that's occurring in your life and bring glory to your Father in heaven. So to flourish in the body of Christ means that we are also living uh, on purpose, that we are being intentional with our witness, that we're wanting to see people who are currently far from God close to God because that's his heart. And that to flourish, we would also be a people of generational blessing. Legacy, I think, is a key word when I think about flourishing. Legacy is something that we deposit into someone. Inheritance is something that we leave for someone. And they're both good. But I'm all about legacy. I I love the opportunity that we have to make a deposit. And every person in this room has that opportunity to make a deposit out of the fruit of your life. See, bearing fruit doesn't just mean that we have fruit for us. And that it is good, right? That we're enjoying the life that we have in Jesus, that we're living in that abundant life. But it's not just for us. We were created to be reservoirs. 
We're vessels. I joke with our church, every one of us has a handle on their back. God fills us up so he can pour us out. Amen? Amen. And so the fruit that we bear is also to be a nourishment to people who are thirsty and hungry for what we have. And so we don't want to be a, the, the people of God with, with big giant fences and walls around our life that aren't we so glad that we're in. No, man, we want to be desperate to populate heaven. Amen. To flourish in every way that God has called us to. So I mentioned John 15, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can tell what kind of night it's going to be. Everybody hunker down. We're going to go after this. John chapter 15, verse one. This is Jesus speaking to us, our Lord, our Savior, our King, our friend, our comforter, our guide, our hope. Amen. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Verse 4, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Tiffany, did you know what I was preaching about tonight? I did not. Was you looking at my notes? <laughs> I thought it was so perfect what she was sharing in communion and the, the correlation of the vine and the juice and remaining and abiding because that's what I'm about. That's really, in this season of my life, uh, I'm the oldest I've ever been. I know I, I know I don't look like it, but I'm the oldest I've ever been. Uh, it's really more about simplicity than it ever has been in my in my time of ministry, it's about the simple things that are the most profound. And this passage is such a beautiful picture, a metaphor, an illustration of what the Christian life should look like, right? Remaining, abiding, and bearing, bearing, bearing fruit. Amen. Now, when Jesus is teaching this passage, and he says to them, and I am the, the true vine, this would have come as a little bit of a shock to, to most of them, um, because what Jesus was declaring is that he was now the source, meaning that up until this time, Israel understood that they were the vine, so to speak, in God's plan for the world. In Psalm chapter 80, verse 7, the psalmist writes, Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine, and that was Israel, that was the people of God. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. And so in that passage in Psalms, there's this correlation that, that Israel up until this time had been known as the vine so to speak, that God's intention for them, and it, and it was true that God's intention was for them as they honored the Lord, as they honored his commands, as they set themselves apart from the other nations of the world, that God would prosper them in such a way that the nations of the world would come to see what was different about them. So they were characterized as the vine, but now Jesus is drawing a pretty strong line in the sand. He's putting a stake in the ground and he's saying that now he is the true vine. And I want to share that with you today because in doing so, I'm reminding you that Jesus is your source. The only way that we will flourish in the way that God has designed and purpose for us, created us to do. The only way that we will bear the fruit of the kingdom of God is as we are absolutely connected to Jesus, our true source, the true vine. Amen? Amen. No Jesus, no flourishing. Right. No Jesus, no fruit, right? Isn't that what Jesus uh, shared with the woman at the well? Do you love that story? One of my favorites in John chapter 4. Jesus told her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up of eternal life. So Jesus is saying the same thing there is that he's the source and that when we are, are tapped into him, 
Not only will we receive the, the, uh, the abundance of what it means to live in him, not only will, will we flourish, not only will we bear fruit, but literally we will become a, a tree that, that brings fruit and flourishing and abundance and nourishment to people who are around us, right? But only in him. Jesus is our source. Now, we, we already know what it looks like to try to find satisfaction, to try to find things that would fulfill the longing in our hearts besides Jesus. Anybody else besides me been down that road? And we realize that when we engage in things outside of Christ for what we're honestly longing for, it only leaves us more empty, right? It's, it's counterfeit. It, it may look good for the moment. It might feel good for the moment. But at the end of the day, it's not worth anything, right? The counterfeit things of the world where Jesus is, is giving us an invitation, even tonight, that I am the true vine. Remain in me, and guess what? Fruit is on the way. Did I say fruit? I don't know why that's happening. With the fruit, it's, it's part of the cold. It's part of the cold, okay. Jesus is our source. He's our strength. He's our joy. He's our hope. He's our provider, Amen. And this is where flourishing begins, family, in understanding this and walking in this knowledge every day. Jesus is our source. And then Jesus says, I love, I love throughout scripture how I, I, we see Jesus, the son and God, the father and God, the Holy Spirit. They're always preferring one another, aren't they? There's such, such a beautiful honor in the Trinity. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm the true vine, but my father, whoo. My father is the gardener. And to me, that just, that takes us again back to Genesis, back to Eden, back to the plan that God had for us. And it was, it was to be uninterrupted, intimate fellowship with God. He says, God is the one that created the garden for man to live and flourish in. Everything was his design and everything was perfect. It had everything that man needed to flourish until man bought the lie that Jesus was, that God was not the source that that they needed, that he wasn't enough or that he was keeping things from them, right? I I love the, the picture of flourishing in the garden. When was the last time you read the book of Genesis? It's awesome. I, I actually did a series through the book of Genesis. I think it took us two years. It might have been, right? I love the book of Genesis because there's just such great uh, descriptions of kind of what God intended from the very beginning. You with me? So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, it says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land, listen, that bear fruit with seed in it. Just think about that for a second. Turn, turn to your neighbor and say, seed in it. Okay, according to their various kinds. And it was so, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day, bearing fruit with seed in it. This is at the heart of what it means to be a believer. That every one of us, Every one of us have the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the seeds of the kingdom of God, of the DNA, of the fingerprint of our heavenly father that created us for intimate fellowship and relationship for him. It's in us. So when we're talking about bearing fruit, we're talking about bearing fruit that's going to bear fruit that's going to bear fruit. You've got an orchard inside of you, not just the seed. Right? Because this is the way that God moves. It's exponential. The things that God wants to do in and through our lives. And so that's why I tell people all the time when they're sharing with me about how they might be telling their friend at work or at school about Jesus. And I don't know. I don't know if they've received it. I don't know if they're getting it. I want to say, listen, don't ever, don't ever uh, shrink back from the opportunity that you have to plant a seed. 
because that's what we're called to do. Amen? Amen. So we're getting this picture of what it means to flourish in the kingdom of God. To bear fruit means that we've got the seed in us and that we are called to be a people that live out loud for the Lord. That's how I got here. That's how I got here is my, my grandparents, actually my great grandparents, my great grandmother who served God and contended for her family. And my grandfather, who was the first four square pastor in our family, was a hell raiser in his town in Iowa. But the story tells, is told in our family that my, my great grandmother was, was that lady in town that if anybody was hurting, if anybody was lost, if anybody needed anything, if, if somebody didn't have a place to live or a, a biscuit to eat, they knew to go to this lady's house. And they, when, when someone would ask, or where does she live? They, they would tell them, okay, go this way and go that way. But when you begin to hear a woman singing hymns, you know you're at the right house. And at that time, my grandfather, again, who was the first generation four-square pastor in our family, at Angelus Temple, he served in, 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 in Amy Simple McPherson's office. He was there in, in, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And the story was that she would, she would tell people about her son, and she, she would say to, to them, he's going to be a preacher someday. <laughs> she was leaning in to the purpose of God for her family. She was believing that there was going to be a generational blessing that was going to come through her son. And I'm, again, I'm a product of that today. My grandmother prayed for me. My parents prayed for me. You have the, an incredible capacity for impact. Every one of us in this room were intended for influence. God is calling us to flourish in such a way that we receive the blessing of it, that the people around us receive the blessing of it, and then ultimately he gets the glory for all of it. Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I was created to flourish. So the fruit that we're talking about here is being like Jesus. That really is it. That's the finish line for every Christian. That we would be conformed into the image of his son. That's what the word of God says in Romans. That we would be more and more like Jesus. That we would love like him. That we would live like him. That we would serve like him. Amen. All right, let's go back to John 15, verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. So various translations kind of interpret this, this passage here in a couple of different ways. One says that this is God that lifts up the branches that don't bear fruit because they're, they've, they've fallen into a place of disrepair. So it's this idea of a trellis that God lifts them up. Another translation says that he cleans those that do bear fruit so that become even more fruitful. But here's what I would like to suggest from these two verses. Is that God doesn't really bother pruning branches that don't bear fruit to begin with. Now, why aren't they bearing fruit? Well, maybe they, maybe they are cut off. Maybe as a result of the fact that they have just chosen not to bear fruit. Maybe they were never really integrated in the vine to, to begin with. Or maybe they were and they said, I don't want anything to do with this vine. I don't want to be a part of this family. I, 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 I'm not going to serve God with my life. And so the Bible says that they're, that's, in, in essence, their choices have caused them to be discarded in a way that God isn't putting his attention on pruning them. But can I tell you where he's putting his attention? On you. What I love about this passage is that God says that as we are bearing fruit, he comes to prune us so that we can bear even more fruit. Amen. And I think that's an encouragement for somebody here tonight. Because pruning is not easy. And it doesn't always feel good. But it's because God is already helping us to understand the potential that lies in our lives. So when God comes to you and me and he says, you know what? That behavior, that attitude, that activity, that's not who you are anymore. It doesn't feel good because our flesh sometimes is inclined to some of the old patterns. 
But what God is really saying is, listen, today is a day of promotion. I'm calling you up by calling you out. I'm going to call you out on something in your life that isn't healthy for you. And that's blocking your ability to flourish and bear fruit because I believe in you so much. Because you're already bearing fruit, I'm going to prune you to be able to bear even more fruit. Does that encourage anybody besides me? Come on. So God is coming to us tonight with an invitation. God has sent me to come to Lodi and say that that there's a promotion waiting for you. And it starts tonight if you'll lean into it. If you'll come into this place again, it says, Lord, the most important thing for me to do The thing that I know that you're calling me to, the thing that's drawing me now is this place of remaining with you, abiding in you because I was created to flourish. Amen. I want to say something tonight too. I didn't plan on saying this, but I'm looking around the room and I see that we have some elders in the house. We have some elders in the house and I want to honor you. And I want to remind you of what we read earlier in in the book of Psalms where the promise was there about the righteous, that they would flourish as the cedars of Lebanon. But there was a promise in there as well, that even in old age, I'm not saying anybody's old, don't look around. (laughs) But in our our elder age, that we would still be fruitful. Amen. 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 I want to say that to anybody in the room tonight that might have thought that their time has come and gone. Nope. God is not finished with you yet. Right? We sing a song. We sing a song. If I'm not dead, he's not done. Come on, church. Amen. So I think it's wonderful. What an encouragement to know that not only is God pruning, expecting of greater fruit, but it's also an indicator of previous fruit. That's an encouragement that the Lord sees you. He sees the things that you're doing. And we're our worst critics, aren't we? Yeah, but I'm not doing this as much as I want. I'm not doing that like I should. I'm not doing, yeah, but you know what? The fact that you're saying it like that shows me that you really want to. And so we're all becoming. Nobody in this room has arrived. I walk around all the time with this coming soon sign on my forehead. Right? Like that construction site on the end of the corner. And there's a picture. Wow, that's going to be awesome. But right now it looks like a dirt field. We're all still becoming. But we're becoming. Get excited about that. Amen. Get excited about tonight, about tomorrow, about what God wants to do you in you and and through you in this next season. I'm excited for you. I can't wait to see what the Lord is going to do. John 15 again, verse four, remain in me, Jesus says, As I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. That word remain is used 11 times in this chapter. In the New King James Version, uh, the word used there is abide, right? And it's it's about closeness. It's about proximity. It's about nearness, right? That's way more important than than pace, than tempo, right? If God's going slow, I want to go slow. If my proximity to God means I'm going to go a little faster than I thought, then we're going to go fast. But I don't worry about my pace. I just worry about my proximity. I want to remain. I want to abide. I want to smell like Jesus. You know, he smelled so good. You know, he did, right? That was a joke, but you know, he did. (laughs) But here's the key. We can't flourish if we don't remain. We can't flourish if we don't remain. And I want to say to you tonight that remaining is not passive. Remaining is active. It's not hunkering down and just waiting for this thing to blow over. It's an active response to the invitation that God draws us near to himself. Because he's making us into the image of his son. Amen. Jesus taught us how to do that throughout his entire life. He continually modeled it for us. He says, I only do what I see the father doing. I only say what I hear the father saying, right? Even Jesus' commitment to silence and, and, and solitude 
was, was such a valuable part and an important part of his example for us. Because when he would steal away from the crowds, oftentimes uh, causing the disciples to be really frustrated because they had just gathered this big crowd, right? And all of a sudden they turned around, where is Jesus? Peter, it, it was your turn to watch him. Where's Jesus? And where was he? He was remaining. He was abiding. He was stealing away from the, from the mechanism, from the crowd, because he knew that he needed time with the Father. Could I, could I offer you that same invitation tonight? That God loves you, and he wants to spend more time with you. Amen? And so we see this example of flourishing in Jesus' life. I think it's so interesting uh, and it, it, it struck me as I was studying this passage for you tonight that, that we see the, the picture of, of, of flourishing beginning in the garden, right, in Genesis. And we see the promises of God throughout the word, throughout the Old Testament, in his promise of Israel and calling them the vine and, and that the people of God would demonstrate that. But then Jesus comes and says, I'm the true vine. I'm the source and then the greatest demonstration of his surrender, of his remaining, staying, was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Another garden. Father, not my will, but yours be done. How could he do that except that he was abiding in the love of the Father in the same way that we're invited to tonight? Because we can't do this in our own strength. Right? We have to do it in the strength that God provides. I, I love that throughout scripture, there's often this illustration of vines and gardens and fruit and flourishing. I think it's really amazing. I had a conversation recently um, with a, an expert that cares for, for vineyards, for vines. And we were just talking about different things. And, and he, he shared something with me that immediately just struck me. And I thought, man, that, that's, that's so important. I think that has such a great correlation to the thing that the Lord is calling us to. This is what he said. When the branches of a vineyard don't get enough water for themselves, they will actually pull water back from the fruit that they are bearing, sacrificing the fruit to self-protect. Think about that just for a second. The, the vine doesn't feel like it's getting the water that it needs. It's fruit still on the vine, but it'll pull the water out to self-protect. And it just it struck me that I, I know that I've done that same thing in my life. When I'm not really following or when there have been times where I wasn't walking in daily fellowship or intimate fellowship with the Lord, receiving the living water from God that I need in order to bear fruit and flourish in the world, what do I do? I sacrifice the fruit that I'm called to bear so I can self-protect. I pull back from my purpose. How do we do that? We distance ourselves from God. It's crazy to me that, that when life happens to people, believers, sometimes the first thing they do is the worst thing to do. Instead of running to church, we don't see them for three or four weeks. It's challenging. What are they doing? They're pulling the water out of the fruit that they're called to bear to self-protect. Why? Not because God hasn't intended them to bear fruit or to flourish, because they're not receiving from God what only he can give. And so we distance ourselves from the Lord. We distance ourselves from time with Jesus and daily fellowship. And as a result of that, our behavior is characterized more by the flesh than the spirit. The way that we treat people. I mean, do you ever catch yourself in a moment where like, why are you so mean? And typically it's why, because the fruit that I'm actually supposed to be giving to that person, maybe who even offended me, I'm pulling back to self-protect because I haven't received from him what only I can get from him. Right? And so it, it reminds us of the importance of remaining, that we will never flourish in the way that we were created to. 
We will never bear the fruit that we were created to. And you were created to flourish. You were called to bear fruit. The Bible says fruit that would last. But it's only going to come as we are committed to remaining and abiding in him. Amen. And it's funny, Tiffany, because, I, again, I just was thinking to myself, man, this girl, she knows exactly what's going on. And it's the Holy Spirit, yeah. right? Because you said something super cool. You were talking about how that uh, in, in, in Israel that, that God provided for them with manna every day, right? And so I th- that's such a great illustration. That's actually in my notes that, that remaining is about going to the Lord every day. It's not something that we store up on Sunday, and hope that it satisfies us all the way to the next Sunday. How, how would your physical body do if that's the way that you treated it? Yeah. Right? But we get like a snack. We get a little brunch on Sunday. And like that's going to sustain you for the next six days? No. Really? No. no. And then we wonder why our spirit is shriveling. We wonder why the fruit is shriveling. It's because we're pulling the water back. Instead of receiving the unlimited resource that we have from Jesus. And it's exactly what happened in, in, in the wilderness is that God gave them manna and said, no, you don't store it up because if you start to store it up, you're going to start to see yourself as the source. Right? And then you're going to start competing in how good you can store it up and start building wagons and trucks and storehouses He says, no, I want you to be reminded every day that I am your source, that whether you know it or not, you are desperate for me. And I believe that's the word of the Holy Spirit for us tonight. Friend, I want to encourage you with this. You are desperate for God. That may not sound like an encouragement, but that's the best thing that can happen to you is to recognize that you're desperate for God, that you can't take another breath without him, another step without him. So it's not to be stored up. It's to be relished and savored every day with God. Jesus taught his disciples to pray in that same way. He says, give us today our daily bread. Remaining is walking in daily fellowship with the Lord. Daily closeness with him. He's our source. He's he's the beginning, middle, and end. Pete Scazzaro uh, does a, an incredible discipleship program called Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. Maybe you've heard of that before. We do that at our church. And, and uh, there's um, a devotional that comes with that. It's called The Daily Office. And it's an opportunity uh, two or three times a day to come before the Lord. And it's such a great way to remain. I, I, I do it every day in my life, whether we're going through a session in that or not, because it's just a, a great way, again, just to, like Jesus did with the Father, just to steal away from the busyness and the mechanism of my life, which is all ministry, by the way. So you'd wonder to yourself, well, you do ministry all day, every day. Why do you need to steal away to be with God? Well, listen, my sermon preparation is not my private time with Jesus. I need to be alone with the Lord every day. And so that daily office is a way for me to abide or remain. And, and maybe there's a, a, something that you're going to use, a resource that you're going to use that I know you guys have amazing ministries here, ways that you can practically get into a new rhythm of remaining, of deep spiritual formation by prioritizing your time with the Lord. Amen. Why? Because you were created to flourish. And God's not going to stop. He's such a faithful father. Right? It's like when my kids were little and they, we would try to teach them how to share. Come on, share with your brother. Right? And, and, and I'm just an earthly dad who, who made mistakes all the time. But the first time that, that my, my son didn't share with his brother, I didn't say, well, he doesn't want to share. I guess just sharing is not going to be his thing. (laughs) Right? Right. Well, I'm going to say this to you. That's how God sees you. And the areas where you're still becoming. You might think, oh, man, that trial passed. I guess that's it. God just gave up on me. No, he's coming around again. He's coming around again. He's a faithful father. He's got amazing plans for you. He believes in you. He's excited about you. He rejoices over you with singing. Your picture's on his refrigerator in heaven. So as we remain, 
the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul writes in Galatians 5, is love and joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Being more like Jesus. Amen. How many load I could use more Jesus? Yeah. I know my city can too. And I said, okay, Lord, do it. He's like, no, go ahead. <laughs> That's why you're there. That's why you're here tonight. To be, to be reminded, you're on assignment. Right? It doesn't matter what you do for a living. You're a secret agent. You're on assignment. And we want to be effective for God, don't we? We want to be effective for him. But unless we can discipline ourselves and learn a rhythm of being with him, we will never be able to do for him in the world in the way that we were designed. And so flourishing begins with remaining, abiding. John 15, 5. I'm going to close. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. So there's some, some pretty big ifs in the scriptures. Do you notice that? How many know if is a powerful word, right? Just two little letters, but man, it whops a punch. So what's the if here? If we remain, we will bear much fruit. That's pretty awesome, right? And when we began our message tonight and I gave you some illustrations of what it means to flourish, how many got excited about that list? Right? Intimacy and closeness with the Lord, deep communion and fellowship with him that bleeds over into every relationship in our lives. Right? A renewed sense of purpose in our health, in our finances, in our stewardship, in our witness. Come on, church. That's an exciting life. That's the abundant life that Jesus has for every one of us. If we remain, these are the promises of God that are there for us. But God gives us a choice. Sometimes I wish he didn't. Right? Lord, just cause me to do it. Right? Just, just make me love you more. Well, love without a choice is not love. And the same thing is true for us. He, he invites us. And the more that we lean in, the more we realize that's everything that we need. Everything that we've been longing for. Amen? So the if is if we remain, man, sky's the limit. Come on. Sky's the limit. Like this year, off the charts. That doesn't mean everything is going to go great. But we're talking about another level of deep spiritual formation that really is worth it. I'm going to tell you right now. Because flourishing is not about stuff. And God's not mad at stuff, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about eternal things. We're talking about people. We're talking about souls. We're talking about your family as a legacy. You as an individual leaning into the purpose that you were created for. So if we remain, sky's the limit. If we don't remain, then I'm just going to basically say it to you like this. We're not going to get to do all the cool stuff. Right? We're not, we're not going to have the strength because you can't do it in the flesh. You can't do spiritual stuff in the flesh. And so if we don't remain, if we don't commit to abiding in that rhythm of intimacy with God, we're not going to be able to do the things that God has created us to do. And if you think you know everything that God has planned for your life right now, you don't. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. Amen? So there's this invitation tonight. Who wants to remain? Who wants to flourish? James chapter four, verse eight says this. Come near to God and he will come near to you. God will never say to you, stop. Tiffany, you're getting too close. Okay, that's, that's enough. Kind of, I had enough of you. God will never say that. 
He'll never say that. He's looking down at you right now. He sees you. He knows everything about you. Right now, you might be distracted by the thing that's going the wrong way. He's not worried about that at all. You might even be like the disciples when they were on the boat with Jesus and, uh, on the Sea of Galilee and, and, and the storm of life was coming over them and they were freaking out like, Jesus, are you even here? Like, do you even care? And he was below deck sleeping. You know why he was able to sleep down there? Because when he got in the boat, he told the disciples, hey, we're going to get in the boat and we're going to go to the other side. You know what that meant? They were going to go to the other side. So he wasn't worried and he doesn't, he's not worried about you. In the sense that he, does, he doesn't know if you're going to make it. He's got great plans for you. And so if you feel like you're in that storm, I want you to know that the Lord sees you. He loves you. But tonight's an invitation to another, another life in Jesus. Of bearing fruit, of flourishing, of experiencing breakthrough in things that have just held us captive for too long. And that all happens in that secret place with him that Jesus demonstrated so beautifully for us, right? Wherever you remain will determine the fruit you bear. Amen. So I want you to think about this. Everybody close your eyes. I'm not going to pray, but I just don't want you to be distracted. Here's the invitation from the Holy Spirit tonight. My son my daughter and he knows your name I created you to flourish let's go let's go no more wasting time now's the season and so I want you to think right now with your eyes closed just in your own heart how this week Will you make the choice to remain? How this week will you make the choice to abide in the true vine?